Alice Onlin and Herbert Konings are founding partners of Security Token Group. All opinions expressed by them or guests on this podcast are solely their opinions and do not represent the views of Security Token Group or its subsidiaries. You should not take any opinion expressed on the show as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow any investment strategy. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to episode 36. It's the Security Token Show. My name is Kyle Sondland, and as always, I'm joined with Herwig Konings, my co-host. Herwig, what's going on? Hello, Kyle, and hello, listeners. Welcome back for those of you returning to the show, and welcome to those of you who are new. This week in episode 36, we're going to be talking about the security token market compared to the public market and their, both their reactions to the corona epidemic and the economic crash associated to it. But before we jump into that, we're going to kick off the show with our companies of the week, followed by our industry news segment covering last week's latest industry updates, as well as an update on the latest STOs and new activity there, followed by a market report. But with that, Kyle, why don't we jump right into it? Who's your company of the week? I love the company of the week segment. It's my favorite opportunity to talk about players in the space that are making big moves that are that are really helping to drive the industry forward. And this week, my company of the week is We Own. And We Own is expanding their marketplace. They launched a financial marketplace to help companies raise equity through the crowdfunding process. And now they're actually expanding that marketplace with just announcing the launch of their new peer-to-peer loans service. And so after launching their equity marketplace, they're now working to assist small businesses with additional opportunities to receive capital. So leveraging the blockchain technology built for their traditional equity fundraising service, they actually created a digital lending platform, making it easy for SMEs to check their eligibility, apply for a loan, and to match with one or more lenders. So after completing a digital application, these businesses can then get an independent credit check, as well as get ratings for their their lending opportunity, which then they can find matches for the business based off of the the rate of return. So as it was noted on their website, about 80% of European small to medium enterprises are micro businesses, which is defined as less than 20 employees and that are seeking loans of 100,000 euros or less. So while these investments can be risky, these businesses really only need a small amount of capital to launch the growth needed for their company. And small businesses can drive economies, and especially in the context of today's markets, small businesses are some of the companies that are hit hardest because they don't have access to bailout plans that have been afforded to some of the world's largest enterprises. So I'm really excited to see how we own can help companies all around the world stay afloat and maintain their healthy business activities that drive our economy forward through this tough time. And on top of that, they have an incredibly supportive and engaged audience that drives positivity throughout the the social media sphere, throughout all of our networks. And I think that that's a tremendous thing to help keep the momentum going and, and, and keep the fire lit during this time. So for those reasons, We Own is my company of the week. Great work to them, and I'm excited to see how businesses are able to access these lines of credit and hopefully survive through the the next couple months of turbulence. Great choice, Kyle. It's great to see issuance platforms like we own dive into both debt and equity issuance services. And for sure, a lending marketplace, as you pointed out, is is very timely right now. I hope it gets to, to market quickly and can be taken advantage of by many SMEs across Europe. And you're, you're absolutely right as well. They have a vocal and active community behind them. So congrats to them. It's well-deserved. Looking forward to more and more great updates from the We Own team in the future. Absolutely. Herwig, what company had your eye this week? So the last couple episodes, I I mixed it up. I chose a a person, a regulator. I'm going back to the the company of the week, Kyle, because this week I really want to highlight a new player on the scene doing, doing one of the firsts in the space, which I'm always a big fan of. And I'm talking about specifically Block Pulse. Now, Block Pulse last week announced that it was the first company in France to register with the ACPR Bank of France, giving the firm the ability to manage euro payments for financial instruments, issuances, and transfers in France. Though Equisafe, the issuance platform also based out of, I believe, Paris, hosted the first French STO back in 2019 for the Anna Mansion real estate STO, Block Pulse is the first French-based issuance platform to achieve this specific registry. 
administration, paving the way for their own vision to be an end-to-end digital fundraising platform for startups. They followed a similar strategy as many U.S. issuance platforms have by also registering as a transfer agent with the French securities regulator AMF, which was also my regulator of the week last week. And the ultimate goal is to become, for, for Block Pulse, a fully licensed stock exchange within 18 months, dubbing themselves the Stock Exchange for Startups. Block Pulse announced a partnership as well with Lemonway, which is going to be powering the KYC and AML compliance on the platform. And the company to date has announced that they already raised 330,000 euros and they intend to launch additional fundraising efforts in Q2 later this year. So, congrats to the Block Pulse team for achieving this critical licenses in order to develop a security token infrastructure in France. Keep it up, and I'm sure we're going to see many, many STOs launched in the meantime till the exchange gets up and running. Yeah, we had initially seen Germany be a leader in the real estate tokenization market, and now we're seeing a lot of success coming out of France, not only from the offerings like this one that you mentioned, but also the regulators have seemed to be very supportive, as we've covered in previous episodes. So it's very exciting to see many of Europe leading countries actually taking a a forward stance in the tokenization space and private security space and and looking to to innovate. I think it's fantastic and and, uh, very, very exciting for the future of of the industry all across Europe. You've got a lot of pro blockchain jurisdictions across Europe, and there is a consistent trend actually calling for a united uh, regulatory framework or sandbox as the French AMF suggested uh, in last week's podcast that I covered. And it's actually very timely to kick off our new segment, which although on the lighter side compared to normal weeks, supposedly due to likely the epidemic, we do want to uh, point out that here in Europe, things are very active, specifically because back in December, the European Commission sought feedback on a regulatory framework proposal for crypto assets and security tokens. And now, just three months later... The EACH organization, or the European Association of CCP Clearinghouses, has published a response in agreement to the proposal. To mark the significance of this, EACH represents 19 different clearinghouses across 15 European countries, including big heavyweights, by the way, like the London Stock Exchange, ICE, and CME Group, among many others. This unified response, I think, is a very important you know, show that the European clearinghouses are absolutely aware of the potential of blockchain and digital security technology, including crypto assets of all kinds, but specifically the group urged that clear and distinct categorization of digital assets between security, payment, utility, and hybrid assets are of critical importance, a theme that we've been talking about since we first started the podcast and you know, a pattern that's being you know, requested across the world by various regulators and jurisdictions. So to me, this is just continued strong validation by traditional market incumbents specifically specifically acknowledging the need for both regulatory clarity via framework as well as the need to support technology. And that public validation didn't stop there, Kyle, because at the same time, the European Central Securities Depository Association, or the ECSDA, also published a report in support of incorporating digital assets into current regulatory frameworks. They themselves were less critical of current frameworks, saying that the current CSDR and similar requirements and frameworks were sufficient to support investment tokens. But the organization, which, by the way, is represented from members like Clearstream, the Euroclear, and the Swiss International exchange said that incorporating crypto assets not falling under the current regulation into the existing financial regulatory framework where appropriate will inject trust and legal certainty, enable their quick adoption, and address financial stability, consumer protection, and market integrity needs. That's two major industry organizations, Kyle, that have now responded to the European Union's request for public feedback, and both of them showing overwhelming support for the adoption of the technology and regulatory frameworks to support the burgeoning crypto and digital security space. Really, really exciting. Such great news. 
You know, it's it's these are the real heavyweights continuing to show validation now in organized bodies to to show the European Union that hey, this is something we support. We've seen it here in the U.S. Let's see which jurisdictions across the world get an edge over one another. But it just makes their jobs easier too. That's ab- the other thing. Absolutely, <laughs> a unified framework you know makes everything tr- dramatically easier. It's something we've we've also called for here in the U.S. and and is being worked on uh, in in a variety of ways. And speaking of the U.S. coming back here, the SEC itself has officially filed an early judgment request against Kick, which is a messaging platform that conducted a $100 million ICO in 2017, and what officials from the SEC are calling ill-gotten gains. Back in June of 2019, the regulator accused Kick of violating several securities laws with their ICO. Regulators claimed to have proof that Kick blatantly informed investors that KIN, which was the token, prices would increase as the platform developed and demand grew. Additionally, Kick representatives stated on multiple occasions that they would undertake crucial work to spur the demand. All of this continues on, even though Kick itself shut down messenger services last September and actually has since been acquired. <laughs> Hired by a company called Media Labs. So this is a pretty crazy story. We'll see if this early judgment is awarded and we'll see if this legal battle finally comes to a close. This is just further proof, though, that ICOs in the U.S. need to be registered and compliant with securities laws today, which, of course, doesn't work for most ICOs. And such SEC actions will continue in order to send that message to the market. And Kick isn't the only one in hot water with the SEC, folks. E-commerce giant Overstock, which is the parent company of Medici Ventures and T Zero, has reported last week that the company is still embroiled in SEC investigations, including over its T Zero security token sale, its digital dividend, and its supposed transaction with GSR Capital, which was announced to be a four hundred million dollar investment, turning up into just five. All of this is happening while the company has a shareholder lawsuit over the untimely C departure and stock sale that came along with it. None of this honestly spells good news or positive news for T0, which itself as a company faced delays with the SEC and its hopes to open up the Boston Security Token Exchange. T0 CEO Som did not comment on Coindesk's coverage of Overstock, though he has been transparent in the past with active CEO updates on the T0 blog, so maybe we'll get another one from him soon regarding this. And some more news from Securitize's subsidiary Boodle, or B-U-I-D-L, which was in the podcast last week for partnering with Lifeful to tokenize distressed and vacant Japanese real estate, is at it again, this time with a partnership with one of Japan's largest companies, one brand that we are all familiar with, Toyota. The partnership will allow the company to launch a new personal ID and vehicle ID platform in the coming months and falls in line with Toyota's expanding interest in blockchain applications. According to company documents, Toyota intends to integrate the two platforms in a myriad of ways to streamline the firm's business systems. Uh, Toyota intends to use the personal ID platform to better monitor and manage the actions of corporate entities, and the new system is meant to simplify a host of other employee-related functions. These functions include employee benefits and digital certificate issuances, and additionally, the company will be working on creating a vehicle ID platform, enabling Toyota to streamline processes considerably across its supply management. The new system allows also for better vehicle registration management and record tracking as well. So Toyota can then better keep ownership records for its vehicles and their life cycles. So this isn't surprising. Boodle launched in 2018 as a general purpose blockchain consulting firm. So the engagement isn't surprising in in the sense that it's not related to Securitize's core business. It does confirm that despite being owned by Securitize, the consulting firm will continue to support enterprise clients of all kinds looking for blockchain solutions, not just security token help. And finally, last up in the news cycles, we're going to stay in Japan, which increasingly is becoming one of the fastest developing blockchain and digital securities infrastructures in the world, and now has another new player coming onto the scene in April, this time backed by multi-billion dollar conglomerate Mitsui & Co., 
uh, SM and the company is partnering up with SMBC Nikko Securities, Sumitomo Mitsui Trust Bank, and Layer X to establish a new company and cooperate in the next generation asset management business utilizing blockchain technology. The company is aiming for digital transformation of the entire asset management function, including efficient financing using blockchain technology. Real estate securitization products, including real estate and infrastructure, involves multiple companies throughout the securitization and subsequent management processes, and with many of these procedures being non-digital and costly. Through the, the process of digital transformation, time costs can be reduced, transparency of investment companies can be improved, fund design can be standardized, and appropriate liquidity can be provided, the company says. The company also claims that it already has a working prototype of the technology and plans to establish a demonstration fund with the aim of verifying operational issues and technical improvements while continuing its dialogue with regulators. So exciting to see the full launch announcement sometime in April for this new platform coming to Japan. And that's it, Kyle. Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on any of that, but uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to you to let us tell us about some of the upcoming industry events. Well, one thing's for sure, make no mistake, regardless of our economic climate right now, builders will build, technology is going to be developed, and we are seeing plenty of progress from many firms all around the world. It's only an inevitability at this point that our technology is going to continue to scale and grow, and it's very, very exciting to see how this continues moving forward. Don't you worry about a thing. We're going to be doing this every week and covering all of the news all around the world no matter what. And to your point, uh, Kyle, we, as we, we talked about last week, you know, in our episode of 35, we talked about how digital security technology is speeding up markets. We've now seen the New York Stock Exchange cancel its, it, and move into a completely electronic trading format. So First this time. is very timely. Very, very timely. All of this is happening. And as you said, it's, it's not going to stop. Absolutely, absolutely. So any news that you've heard today or in any episode of the podcast ever, you can catch on stomarket.com slash news. That's where we post all of our news from each week. We have a comment section where we can engage with interested listeners and, and participants as well. So you can catch all of that news there as well as in the description of wherever you're listening, whether that's through one of the streaming services such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts or through YouTube as well. We post um, all of our stuff there as well. So definitely check that out uh, if you're interested in reading more about any of these interesting articles. And if you want to submit anything for future articles, definitely submit it at stomarket.com slash news. Please join the community. Please, yeah, definitely join the community. It's, it's fantastic. It's growing, and we get a lot of feedback as well as a lot of submissions from many of our listeners, and, and it's a, a fantastic way um, for to help us because we put in probably 10 to 12 hours of work into this podcast to, to get this in, in tip-top shape. And so if you have anything that we missed or anything from your company that you're looking to promote, certainly send that our way. Moving on, we're going to start talking about some events. Unfortunately, it's not the most timely um, circumstances to host an in-person event, but there is a tokenizing real estate virtual conference, an online networking event by Expanse, as well as Startup Agora, that will be on Wednesday, March 25th. So this upcoming Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. EST, 2.30. So by attending this conference, they hope that attendees will learn both how real estate tokenization works as well as the understanding the business opportunities in the space. So it will be a great opportunity to learn a little bit more about real estate tokenization and, and the opportunities there. And they also are going to have a separate section that's more of a networking opportunity so you could potentially meet um, people you may want to work with in the future or even just in enthusiasts or, or interested connections. So definitely check that out. It might be a great way to connect and socialize a little bit while we're all kind of cooped up at home. It could be a great way um, to, uh, to do that. So check out tokenizing real estate it's a virtual conference by expanse and startup agora we also have two more events that are in person the first one securities finance technology symposium 2020 that's on may 7th in london they were planning to cover blockchain-based lending securitization and more um, but they have noted that they're monitoring the cancelization of the event and a refund policy if needed. March uh, May 7th is is definitely seems like it could be up in the whims right now um, based off of what, what the climate looks like. However, it is still on as of now, and if it does get rescheduled, we certainly will keep you updated there. 
And finally, we have the Security Tokens Realized San Francisco event. That one is on May 28th, and you can can find out more about that one as well, but we'll keep you updated on the, the status of those events moving forward. From there, it's time to talk a little bit about some security token offerings. We have one new security token offering to discuss today, and this one is the Wave Kentucky Whiskey 2020 Digital Fund. And as a whiskey connoisseur myself, I was very excited about learning more about this offering, and so I got all the details here for you. The first one is that it is a fund based off of 25,000 barrels of bourbon from the Wilderness Trail Distillery founded by Pat Heist and Shane Baker. So that's a U.S.-based distillery, and they've launched a, a 25,000-barrel backed fund of security token of a security token. And so that equates to about 4 million bottles of bourbon uh, based off of that supply that they have in, in the vault, which is worth an estimated $20 million. And so all of those barrels, all of that whiskey is stored and maintained by the distillery, with a value calculated quarterly. And they're working with with two different firms, LA-based Wave Financial, which will help with the the management of the fund, as well as the Vertalo, Austin-based Vertalo issuance platform that will be launching this on the Tezos blockchain. And so Wave Financial expects for their selected bourbon to result in the fund providing investors with around a 20% IRR over six years. So they're very confident in the future of this fund. Um, The terms of the specific token have not been announced yet, but there's much more you can research regarding the the distillery itself, Wilderness Trail, as well as Wave Financial. You can find more information in the description. But very exciting, a whiskey digital fund. We've seen some funds launched from wine. We've seen some funds launched on many other things. It's exciting to see some of these commodities being leveraged as collateral for, for funds, especially in some in the alcohol, which we've seen significant appreciation in, in alcohol um, in the past. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting security token offering, certainly one that you would not have much access to before the advent of security tokens. Definitely a unique structure, Kyle. Very, very fascinating. Uh, I'm curious to know if they're, they're going to actually end up selling the underlying inventory over the next six years to provide that return, or if they're simply going to sit on it and expect the value of the inventory to grow itself. But all in all, really great structure, as you said, very unique way to get access to both a specific whiskey brand and the whiskey asset class in general. Really, really cool model. Yeah, so I'll see if I can get more information, certainly as, as these things go over the, the coming weeks and months. There will be more and more information disseminated, and we'll have more opportunities to discuss. But it's an exciting start and something to look forward to in 2020. Finally, we have our market update before we hop into the main topic. And our market update this week, we do have some interesting things to discuss the first one being the total market cap for STOs. It actually held pretty solid at around $47 million. This is similar to what we saw last week. And despite that, T0, which is our, our main market mover, was down 30% on Monday. So it's below a dollar for the first time since December. Market cap has now fallen below $20 million. So it's definitely not doing that great. I think that there's certainly, we've been talking about this for a long time, and I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but certainly T-Zero's price, I think, certainly struggles with the fact that they have no additional assets launched on their platform. If you remember, they were going to launch their overstock digital dividend that was supposed to happen from what I had heard in early March. We still haven't seen that distributed to investors. We haven't seen another asset go live on the exchange yet. And so, you know, certainly in a time of, of, a liquidity crunch, if you will, in public markets, it does seem to be that investors are shedding some of their position in T0, um, potentially because of a lack of confidence, potentially just because it's mirroring the markets. But we can cover more of that in our main topic. Other tokens this week, Lottery.com continued its odd trading patterns. This week, its price increased by 50% in, in, on March 20th. Um, it's a little fishy though because only one share was purchased for a grand total of 15 cents. So, um, you know, the market cap increased technically from 4 million to 6 million on this trade, but it's clearly not indicative of any level of demand considering 15 cents were bought to cover a, a big sell off. So, 
Um, you know, I, we're, we're evaluating how to properly display this moving forward. Um, but you know, it's, it's something to note for sure. Um, and the real estate properties on the market have performed strongly in contrast to the rest of the markets, all of which they've held their prices very consistently over the past month. Um, so we'll cover a little bit more of that as well in the main topic. But in terms of new tokens, I'm really excited to announce that we have three more real estate properties added to STO Market. These are the three newest real estate tokens issued by Realty on the Uniswap exchange. So they're now up to six tokens. And here at Security Token Market, we're now tracking 12 live security tokens, and many of which are updated programmatically on the hour every hour. So let's talk about some of these three these three properties. The first one is uh, is 12428 Appaline Street. This is a 12,000 square foot 15 unit apartment building in the Barton McFarland neighborhood of Detroit. And so this apartment complex is currently fully rented with a wait list of available renters due to their below market rate of $620 per month in rent per unit. The asset price is evaluated at around $580,000 with a yearly rental income across all of the properties of $100,000 so per year. So they've issued 4,000 tokens total for the property, which generate around $17.21 per year, which is an estimated 11% dividend interest rate. The tokens are now live and they're trading at $142.27, which is around where they, they initially sold at. So it's held its price okay. And remember, with these tokens, they pay a dividend rent, dividend rate of the you know rental income, as well as you are a, a partial owner of the property. So you not only are exposed to the dividend rental income, but you also are exposed to the equity appreciation in the the real estate itself. So that 11% dividend is just the dividend. Then you're also exposed to any additional appreciation that, that the property receives. The second token is 20200 Leisure Street, which is a 1,000 square foot single family home in the Blackstone Park neighborhood in Detroit. And with an initial sale price of uh, or $69.40, the $7 of rental income per year nets a 10.24% interest rate on the property. So the property was divided into 1,000 tokens. And so Thousand times the sixty nine dollars and forty cents estimates the property at around seventy thousand dollars, give or take. And so the prop, the the tokens themselves are trading at a slight discount at sixty six dollars and forty cents on Uniswap, but again with a ten percent interest rate on the rental dividend. The third and final property by Realty is nine three three six Patton Street. This is another single family home in Detroit, and it is also netting in investors a similar ten point two percent dividend interest rate, and is selling for around sixty one dollars per token. This one also has a thousand outstanding tokens, and the property fully sold out and is now only available for purchase on Uniswap. The other two properties, Appline and Leisure, are newer, and they are both available on the Realty platform as well as on Uniswap Exchange because they can actually provide liquidity for earlier investors as well as selling out their initial supply. So they are also tradable on Uniswap as well. And it's very, very interesting, you know, just like the other three real estate properties that we've seen that are already live and have already been issued, these tokens have, have held their prices strongly um, despite the market climate. So I, I also, it's, it's a, an interesting little piece, but I like the fact that they keep the token supply low. Herwig, I don't know what your opinion is on, on that kind of thing, but we've seen many issuers in not only the crypto space, but even some of the early security tokens that will issue millions and millions of tokens. And often I feel that that's not necess- necessary for the actual launch. Realty has kept their token count very low, which makes it much easier to manage as well as much less complicated for the actual offering. And so I think that that's a refreshing change of pace versus you know the 44 million outstanding tokens or whatever that we see in some of these other tokens. So that's a, an interesting facet for these ones that seems to be one of the reasons why they're selling out extremely quickly. 
Yeah, I think it, they've definitely priced their their tokens well, and and like you said, maybe it makes it easier to manage on a, a smaller level. I think it, it honestly comes down to the project and the size and the scope and how they want to price each individual token. A lot of people like to peg it to one dollar. In this case, they're not doing that. They're they're coming up with a very rational way of of coming up with the value per token, and ultimately, you know, these are all individual, either multifamily or single family projects, and therefore they're much smaller than say a multi-million dollar you know company right. or equity raise right so a lot of different factors to take into account but definitely all, all nevertheless all very exciting stuff great to see realty continuing to grow and add more and more properties to the market it makes for very interesting data insight which i think is probably a, a good segue into our main topic what do you think I think so. It's uh, you know the the goal for this week was just to kind of take a look a little bit at the public markets and what we've seen with the significant sell offs and the significant decline of, of global markets around the world. Specifically, we focus here on the U.S. markets because it's what we're most familiar with, but it's also just the largest financial center around the world. So I think it's an interesting comparison to take a look at the the public markets versus the private. And, and I'm certainly happy to start it off by by looking at, you know, first we wanted to compare how the public markets have tanked in the last, you know, four to five weeks versus the security token market. And so when we take a look at the S&P 500, it's down about 35% versus the security token market, which is down about 32%. So it does, Herwig, seem to mimic what we're seeing in the public markets, which I guess makes sense. Yeah, that doesn't not necessarily surprise. You know, I think with anything, if we were to capture a third side of the market, the actual private market versus the private tokenized market, we, we'd find that it's it's fascinating to see that it's mirroring a public market because I would hypothesize that the private market is potentially an even worse situation due to liquidity premiums and the like. So the fact that the, the security token market is mimicking the public market, I think is actually a, a strong sign that, uh, you know, the, the technology is working and that assets aren't necessarily suffering from specific liquidity issues or premiums. Absolutely. And we've seen even some issued security tokens that have totally moved against the tr- general trends in the public markets, specifically real estate. And so, you know, what we liked, what we tried to do here was was take a look at how the REITs were affected, which is really the only public market equivalent to some of these fractionalized real estate opportunities, and then compare that to some of the realty tokens that have been issued. And it was very interesting when we look at, at some of the the top um, REITs in the in the world, or at least in the, the New York Stock Exchange. We have the American Tower. REIT, which is the largest, which is the ticker AMT. We've got Crown Castle, which is CCI. We've got Prologis, which is PLD. And then Simon Property Group, which is SPG on the public markets. And so those are the top four REITs. And so I took a look at those. And what we saw from those is that AMT is down 27%. CCI is down 30%. PLD is down 34%. And SPG is down 66% just in the last month. So these REITs have been taking a beating. And it's interesting because we've always heard that real estate is that kind of safe asset or, or you know, less risky than the stock markets and things like that. But certainly the REITs themselves have really struggled to hold any semblance of value, which is fascinating, um, especially when we compare that to realty. Um, I took a look at, at the realty properties and conducted a weighted average calculation across the six live properties and found that across the six properties weighted by market size or market cap rather, they're up 2.12% since the the same time frame. Over the last month, the properties are up 2% and that's in equity value, not counting the daily dividend, which pays out double digits on a yearly basis. So investors probably are up two two to three, maybe three to four percent in the last month versus investors in REITs that are down anywhere from 30 to 66 percent in the same time frame. That's pretty interesting, Herwig. Now, that's an incredible insight. Absolutely. I mean, what you're essentially saying is that instead of paying somebody to be a, a manager uh, for a group of you know real estate projects, I myself can just go own these six tokens and I'd actually be doing better than I would be holding onto that REIT. 
Um, and there's definitely, obviously, a lot of different factors that you know that come equated into this. Of course, people want liquidity, and so a lot of people hold REITs and are perhaps looking to move it out of that uh, as a as a portfolio strategy. Realty is also interesting because it offers that daily dividend, which is not something that treats offer. So it's, it's very, very interesting to see you know that at least in this case, Realty is actually defying what the public markets is doing. And we know it's a small sample size. We're only talking about a few million in, in real estate value. Uh, but in the end, uh, definitely still an interesting insight. Absolutely. So it's, it's fascinating. And, and uh, yeah, I like what you said a lot about, about you know, personally owning those properties. It's, it's, we'll have to see how this continues. We'll certainly monitor the, certainly the, the realty properties and, and maybe compare that to REITs in another month or in two months and see, see if the, the same kind of differences apply or if, or if they end up following suit. Definitely so, a useful exercise, and it's worth pointing out, Kyle, that a REIT as a, a you know real estate investment trust is different than owning the properties themselves. So perhaps the REIT's underlying portfolio is maintaining uh, the value, but it's certainly the the fund on the public market is not. Uh, so so definitely, I think it's a good inter- interesting exercise to do in a couple months. Another good point. Definitely, we'll have to see if those tend to rebound or uh, if they continue to struggle and. and maybe try to analyze why that's happening. So it's fascinating, fascinating stuff. On top of that, we wanted to take a look at the movement of money. And so everyone seems to be rushing into treasuries, but we wanted to look at gold, maybe silver, and and compare that to to some of the stable coin volumes over the last month and, and see what that looked like. So I also took a look into those. From my research, it looks like gold is down 8.5%. Silver is down 15.3%. Bitcoin, obviously, most people listening to the podcast may be familiar, is down almost 35% in the last month, as well as stablecoin volume itself is down around 37%. So obviously, with a stablecoin, it is pegged to the dollar, so the price itself hasn't changed. But what we can measure is the volume of transactions leveraging stablecoins because they're all built on public blockchain. Blockchains, so the transactions themselves can be monitored by by research firms. And so, what we found from Masari Crypto is that the stablecoin volume over the past month is down just over thirty seven percent. And now, now I think that one's also really interesting, Kyle, because uh, I think it makes sense that some of these commodities that you pointed out are are headed downwards or seeing some kind of a correction, if you will. But there are, you know, a lot of movement going into treasury, safe hard assets, etc. You would think that maybe some of these stablecoin pegged to some of these. Uh, potential bonds or safer assets and things like that, or even currencies, would actually see an increase in volume, and we're seeing a, a very correlated to the market drop as well. So, you know, had you made, you know asked the question to me ahead of the show, I probably would have expected maybe stablecoin volume to remain the same or potentially even go up. But it, it's very clear that uh, perhaps there aren't the right stablecoins, or perhaps the infrastructure there isn't quite ready to support, you know, an economic crash. Uh, like like this data suggests. And in fact, there was a, a Paxos article on securities.io talking about how they're seeing adoption of their, their gold-backed stablecoin and their, their Pax uh, stablecoin as well. Uh, but ultimately, this data suggests quite the opposite, that that is indeed not the case. That's, uh, and in fact, stablecoins may uh, face some trouble uh, in the coming markets. Yeah, it's interesting. We, we definitely, I think, should, should revisit this topic in in a little while, or, or potentially even monthly, or something like that, while we're we're going through this this turbulent economic time to continue to compare these things, because it will be interesting to see if a lot of the reasons behind this are due to the initial fear, that initial scare, or or the initial fleeing of a lot of the riskier alternative investments that we then see kind of come back after the, the market's relatively stable out. Certainly any time of where we're seeing the the markets decline by 5, 10, 15 percent in a matter of a week, you're, you're not going to have rationally moving markets. So it will be fascinating to see over time if these same trends are maintained or if we see some kind of different pattern emerge in, in a more rational market. 
Definitely sounds like there's demand for an update on this segment uh, main topic here in a couple months for sure. But lastly, I do want to take one last look. Of course, you know, IPOs have definitely frozen or dried up, if you will, uh, amongst all this madness. And we're, we're still seeing a lot of new STOs announced. You just announced yours. We, we announced one last week. We're still seeing a lot of activity. Uh, but I will say that we still haven't seen any successful closings, so that might be more closely correlated to to the public markets as well there. We'll be sure to review that in the, the update, I guess, as well, to see if the fundraising potential or momentum, if you will, for security tokens has slowed compared, of course, to their IPO counterpart. Unfortunately, I think in, in turbulent economic times, that, that can be expected is that the, the risk capital seems to be less and less intense. There's less appetite for, for earlier and earlier investments. But at the same time, there does seem to be a lot of demand for, for new and interesting vehicles, certainly things that are less correlated to the public markets that maybe are overinflated or, or over leveraged. So I, I still have tremendous hope and, and I'm, I'm very confident that the, the technology and the structure continues to improve every day. And it's only a matter of time until we start to see more and more successful offerings. So this I, I have not changed my opinion uh, on the markets and where this is going. And we I certainly know that you haven't either, Harry. Well, I think it's very clear, Kyle, as more and more assets and security tokens enter the, the industry, we are able to garner more and more insights. And it's it's very clear that, that they are here to stay and they are, are here to play, if you will, as part of the overall you know, economic infrastructure of the world. Yeah, if anything, this is what we're seeing in the public markets is actually even more justification for why we need accountability on the scale of security tokens in terms of having these 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 public ledgers and, and being able to track and log these things across across all jurisdictions and, and, and building a more structurally sound financial system without relying on on some of these over leveraged firms. So it'll be very interesting to see. Um, but with that, that's about all for me. We, we covered our 40 minute episode. You better believe that we're coming back with all of the top news every week. You may not have a commute to listen to since you're chilling at home, but hopefully you enjoyed the episode. Hopefully you'll give us some feedback, potentially send us some articles. Tell us what you liked, what you didn't like, what you want to see in the future. That's about it for me. Thanks for listening. Hope to catch you next week. Mm-hmm.